Good afternoon. My name is Kent Mormon, and I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as the Dr. Cog TAC. I call to order the January 11, 2021, Dr. Cog Special TAC Work Session. As a reminder for the agenda item questions and comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you all also unmuted on your end. Please state your, who you are and represent and then proceed speaking. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to the staff in the question box. Again, please use the raise hand feature and identify who you're representing um, on there. At this time, um, Cam, if you would uh, list all attendees that you have so far. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the attendees that I currently see are Amanda Brimmer, Art Griffith, Brad Calvert, Brooke Svoboda, Chris Chauvin, Chris Hudson, Christopher Montoya, Daniel Hutton, Danny Berman, David Gaspers, Deborah Basket, Eileen Yazzie, Elizabeth Relford, um, Emily Lindsay, Eugene Howard, Flo Rotano, Heather Paddock, Jean Sanson, Jeff Dackenbring, Jessica Michael Bust, Jim Katzer, John Gunther, Jordan Ruddle, Josie Hadley, Justin Bagley, Kelly Heaton, Lisa Nguyen, Lucas Dubja, Mac Callison, Mark Ambrose, Mark Devos, Matt Marshall, Matthew Schubert, Megan Davis, Michael Romero, Mike, Mike Whitaker, Paul Jacetus, Phil Greenwald, Sarah Castro, Sarah Grant, Stefan Pollat, uh, Stephen Strominger, Steve Duran, Tammy Mbrar, Thomas Reef, Thomas Sch Schumer, TJ Scarberry, Wayne Howard, William Haas, and William Soros. Thank you, Cam. If for some reason you did not hear your name, please email Cam at C Kennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself and press star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and your comments and your line will be muted. Cam, please unmute all participants at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, they have all been uh, unmuted on my end. Okay. So, so once again, if, if you have a comment, please raise your hand or if you're on the phone, uh, star six and speak. Do we have any hands raised, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, would you, uh, uh, Cam, please take a moment and mute everyone again. Okay. Okay, they've been mis uh, they've been muted again, Mr. Chair. Okay. At this time, I'd like to uh, turn um, over the meeting to Ron Papsdorf uh, for a brief introduction to our topic today. Good afternoon, everybody. Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. I did want to just introduce this um, topic to kick things off before I hand over to Todd Cottrell to walk us through the conversation this afternoon. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the special work session. Um, I know it's a little rushed right after the holidays, especially, and trying to cram in an extra meeting. I'm sure everyone's really busy, but um, just a little bit of context for this item. Uh, I think most of you would have been aware that we had um, just started sort of working through our normal waitlist um, 
process because we knew we we knew we anticipated to have some unallocated uh, uh, unprogrammed uh, funds available for the transportation improvement program and then to the surprise of I think just about all of us um, when Congress passed the its omnibus uh, tw 2021 appropriations bill they included uh, wrapped in some coronavirus response and relief funding um, which wasn't a terrible surprise what was a surprise about that was that that package included um, some uh, surface transportation funding in addition to transit and airports and otherwise um, to the tune of um, almost 10 billion dollars allocated in the form of surface transit surface transportation block grant program uh, which uh, those that have been around the region for a while know that um, those surface transportation block grant funds are typically sub allocated to large urban areas with populations over 200,000 uh, within states uh, for allocation through transportation improvement programs. Um, so as a result of that, we're expecting, a, although we haven't seen the final apportionment tables from Federal Highway Administration yet, uh, we're expecting about $36 million of these funds uh, to be sub-allocated to Dr. Cog as Dr. Cog directed surface transportation block grant funds. Um, and while the funds in the legislation have um, you know, and basically an expiration date of the end of September 2024. Um, we, we like CDOT are interested as much as possible in getting these funds out um, as quickly as possible to help create jobs and stimulate the economy as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this is the beginning of a conversation with all of you about our process and how we're gonna approach this uh, with the goal of getting a decision package to the Regional Transportation Committee and the board at their March meeting. So we'll have a, this is the first of a couple of conversations with all of you. Um, and with that context, I, I'm happy to hand it over to Todd to walk us through the conversation. Thank you, Ron, and good afternoon, everyone. So um, uh, thanks, Ron, for the, for the introduction. Um, the only thing I, I didn't hear is I, I just wanted to bring it up to a little bit of context of where we were so obviously we started the waiting list process um, last March and we, we kind of held that um, to really address sort of the, the COVID-19 issues that existed within the existing TIP projects. You know, and, and at that time we had accumulated approximately $7 million, $17 million in unallocated funds. You know, and this was accumulated through project returns, project closeouts, and you know, additional fiscal year money that just happened to come our way since we adopted the, the current 20 to 23 tip. So that sort of brought us up to this total of, the, of approximately $53 million that we have estimated right now. Um, obviously, as we go through this plot process, it's very fluid. That number may be adjusted as we you know, know in, uh, contain additional information, but certainly I think we're in the ballpark where we have the knowledge to kind of take the steps to move forward in this process. And it, it really kind of follows the waiting list process, which is outlined in Appendix D of the adopted 20 to 23 TIP document. Um, I, and this gets a little confusing because I hear it sort of both ways, but the TIP policy actually doesn't contain the waiting list protocols. It's, it's only, re it makes reference to them, but really what we're talking about is the heart of Appendix D within the actual TIP document. Um, and also contained with this attachment, it is referenced and contained with an attachment too. So as I mentioned earlier, we did start this process back in March, um, but the policy does contain three basic steps. Um, the first being to split any available new allocations and any project returns and closeouts that took place on projects prior to the 20 to 23 TIP project selection basically 20% to the regional share and 80% to the sub-regional share, then of course sub-allocating that 80% to the sub-regions. Um, any project returns or closeouts from projects selected in the 20 to 23 um, TIP process, so since any of those that were selected under the regional and sub-regional share process, those get, direct those get directed to the appropriate sub-regional uh, forum waiting list for, for reprogramming. Um, if you can reference attachment one, that does contain the current breakdown 
by regional, subregion, and then of course, in the, even further into the individual subregions. Um, step two in the waiting list process uh, is actually a step that we've sort of already started up and sort of wrapped up last week, but certainly we would entertain if anyone still wishes to advance their existing projects. This just gives the existing TIP project sponsors the ability to maybe reach a certain milestone or a certain phase and are looking for that funding uh, quicker than they may wish. I think from the Dr. Cox perspective, we certainly don't want to be um, the ones to hold back any of your projects. And then finally, step three of the waiting list process is to select the projects from the actual waiting list. Um, and just to note, these are individual project sponsor decisions. Um, so and you, we're not requiring any sort of decision or discussions that need to go back to the individual forums for those actions to take place. So now this, this gets us to the actual individual waiting lists, which are contained in attachment two. And sort of where the context for this memo and discussion comes about. So if you compare the projects in the funding listed on, listed on each individual uh, waiting list in attachment two with the anticipated funding that's available to each of the regional and sub-regional shared waiting lists, which again are back in attachment one, there are some waiting lists that do not have enough projects um, like Jefferson County or some that are likely to not have enough projects just based on the conversations that we've already had um, with some of those individual sponsors. Uh, and this possibly includes Adams County and Southwest Weld. There's also an uncertainty out there that it's likely um, more could fall short of, more, more of these waiting lists could fall short of projects uh, if sponsors wish to lo no longer pursue their projects, and certainly that we haven't had conversations with. And this could be uh, maybe they've already started the project with local funds, um, or certainly are just no longer interested in pursuing that project. Um, so sort of in response to all this, um, you know, Dr. Cog has sort of developed these next steps and sort of outlining what we are certainly interested in doing. Um, in allowance of the TIP policy that we have. So essentially number one is take the action to advance the, fund, the funds as requested. So essentially this is step one, um, or step two of the waiting list process. Um, and again, we've already started this process, but certainly if you are still interested in advancing some of your funds, we certainly could entertain those. Um, number two, um, begin the waiting list process soon, and this could be as, as soon as tomorrow, again, based on any feedback we, that we may receive from everyone today, um, by contacting the first project sponsor on each waiting list. Um, number three, um, since the COVID-19 funding has an expiration date at the end of federal fiscal year 24, um, this program, the COVID uh, surface transportation block grant funding to all programmed projects um, within the TIP. So it, this could be existing TIP projects, could be projects from the waiting list, or if any there's new, any new projects selected, um, that can go to add within federal fiscal year 21 and 22. And finally, uh, conduct a new call for projects in any forum that still has funding available to program after we have contacted each project sponsor on the existing list. So this sort of gets at solving some of the problems that we had indicated earlier. Um, through this new call for projects, um, we certainly could use the existing applications we already have. Um, this call would need to have committee and board approval uh, since it is a variance to the adopted waiting list protocols that are contained in, uh, within the TIP. We anticipate that we could begin this process as early as maybe late April or May uh, and hopefully wrapping this up by the fall. Certainly with this call, if it were to take place or other parameters that are essentially to be determined, um, this could be project limitations in size or amounts, um, the number of applications, things such as that. Um, and of course, any projects that are recommended by the forums and approved by the board will be placed on their waiting list um, to uh, use this unallocated funding with the remaining projects to be placed at the end of the waiting list to build um, 
those lists back up. So essentially, we're looking at the call for projects to add additional projects to forum waiting lists where necessary. Um, so this is not going to affect everyone, um, but we certainly you know, have come to notice that there are situations with some waiting lists where uh, we will need to build those lists essentially back up um, for whatever reason. So this is, again, just sort of the next steps that Dr. Cog's staff is looking at for the process. Um, we certainly would be interested in getting your feedback, you know, to any aspects here presented, any questions you may have, um, but certainly I think this could be used as a springboard for some of these discussions today. So Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to, um, again, we can kind of, if anyone does have any questions, we certainly could take those, or if there's any large topics that any one would like to address, we certainly can begin with those. So just a reminder, if you have any questions to raise your hand um, or star six and let us know that you'd like to speak. Um, Cam, do we have any that have raised their hands? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The first hand raised that I see is from Art Griffith. So, Art, you've been unmuted. So, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, so, would there also be an option for um, a subregion to allocate their portion to another subregion if it was a mutual uh, beneficial project? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly wouldn't see a reason why not if that's the wishes of an individual forum. And uh, or, this is this is Ron Todd. I'll, I'll weigh in a little bit too. As a matter of fact, I think um, given that our goal is to we want to advance as many projects as we can that aren't already programmed, so that we can show that you know this these additional funds are actually going to work quickly, not just supplanting funds that we're going to get spent in the near term anyways. Um, and, uh, you know, keep in mind that the dual model process, the, the targets for the subregions are targets. They're not a sub allocation of TIP funds. And so recommendations from the subregions go to the board. The board ultimately, make, ultimately makes those decisions. We're trying to get, um, as you all know, the best set of projects that we possibly can. And um, kind of with those goals in mind, um, to the extent that there's a subregions feel like um, it would be better to allocate funds to um, a project that has mutual benefit, we're, we want to hear those ideas. Are there any additional hands raised? I do not see any uh, hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. So Todd and Ron, this is Kent. Um, are you going to? Are you asking that we get our county forms re um, meet this month then to work on these project lists? I think there's a Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll um, ask Todd to weigh in, but I'll, I will suggest that mostly the the wait list process is sort of with individual project sponsors, but I don't think there's harm in the subregions getting together if they have time. We probably have about five weeks to work through this process. Okay. Todd, anything else on that? No, I mean I mean the the first step that you know I'll be taking, which again could be as early as tomorrow, is really to reach out to the first project sponsor on each individual waiting list. And the question will be, do you want to accept this funding, yes or no? If the answer is no, I'll move on to the second project sponsor on the list and continue down the list. Um, the call for projects really only comes into play is if we've reached the end of an individual waiting list and we still have funding to allocate. So I am hoping that we can get through each individual discussion by each individual project sponsor in a a short time frame um, but i think i don't disagree with what you were saying ron and where 
it would not hurt to go ahead and and begin scheduling maybe a forum one just in case and then two if there's any really outstanding issues or questions that may come up um, as even as art mentioned there may be opportunities where um, it could be worth the while of a individual forum to maybe look at putting their money into a a project that has mutual benefits um, that might not work for everyone but i don't think there's any harm in at least putting some meetings on the calendar um, to really make sure that we've got our bases covered i'd also i'd also really encourage project sponsors um, you know look at projects that are have already been selected in the tip that might be programmed in you know 22 or 23 um, that maybe could be advanced um, with this additional money into an earlier year, 21 or 22. Um, keeping in mind that um, uh, CDOT uh, sharing our interest in getting these dollars out the door as quickly as possible has committed to, to working with all of us to streamline the grant agreement process and get grant agreements um, done more quickly than they typically um, might be anticipated to be completed, um, including potentially bringing on some additional temporary staff to help with workload, um, as well as working at us, working with us to look at opportunities to streamline the design review process and other steps in the process to get from to get a project out to add as quickly as possible. So uh, we'll we'll have some conversations with with all of you as well about what kind of feedback we can provide, what kind of opportunities we can provide to CDOT to take advantage of a willingness to help streamline those processes uh, with our goal to get these get these projects moving as quickly as possible. So my, my challenge to project sponsors would be really look hard at the projects you already have selected and program maybe for later years in the TIP to see what opportunities there might be to advance, what it might take to advance them so that we can give that feedback to CDOT. Um, and then also consider waitlist projects that might be you know more ready to go than others quickly um, doesn't change the total amount of unprogrammed dollars but in the interest of getting the covid relief monies um, portion of this out the door as quickly as possible we're going to we're going to certainly focus on those projects first thank you ron did we have anyone that that phoned in that would like to make any comments? If so, uh, star six and, and go ahead and give your name and who you represent and speak. I do not hear anyone there. Cam, do we have any additional hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any additional hands raised at this time. Um, I had one other question for you, Ron and Todd. Um, will this still be the split that we had in our tip originally um, of 80-20 on these projects? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So it, I'm not hearing a lot of other questions. Um, is the the assumption that what we're putting forth is straightforward, makes sense, um, makes it's logical? Uh, Todd, so this is Cam. We just got a hand raised from uh, Miss Eileen Yazi. So if it's okay with you two, uh, Eileen, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, Thank sure. Um, thanks for calling the work session together, um, Dr. Cogstaff and Chair. Um, I actually want to back up to what the chair, the question the chair just asked, or maybe I may have heard it incorrectly, or maybe I heard it correctly. Would the CARES Act funds uh, be programmed at an 80-20 split? Yes. CARES, so any any new allocations will automatically come in and are split 20% to regional and 80% to the sub-regional and then further split out to each individual forum. Sorry, I was asking about for the for the uh, cost share of a project. So if, I'm, if I understand the current uh, policy is that 80% would be 
federal or Dr. Cog funded, and then 20% would be locally matched per project. Does that still stand for the CARES Fund or CARES Fund will be using the 100% funding? So at this time, yes, we understand that the funding ratios um, are eligible for 100% federal funding. And this certainly can be a discussion that we can have today. Um, and I think um, there's some issues that surround that with the system that we have because, you know, uh, having some projects uh, be matched at, you know, an 80-20 split while others are not certainly does bring up some, you know, some of these issues that contain equity and what's fair and what's not fair. So certainly if, if anyone would like to weigh in, um, we'll certainly take those. This is Eileen again. Um, I mean, I'll advocate to use the 100% um, funds and I think that there could be maybe even a carrot related to your bullet number three. Is that for projects that are ready to go to add in 2021 or 2022 that they do receive that beneficial 100% um, CARES Act funding. Um, I'll, I'll toss that out to continue discussion. Um, and then I did have another question, but it already slipped my mind. So I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. I, thanks, Eileen. Um, Mr. Chair, if I can weigh in on that question, because it's a really important policy question, and I want to put, I want to kind of frame that conversation that, um, a little bit. So the. Go ahead, Ron. The, COVID relief funding that were the uh, we're, we're talking about specifically here um, in the legislation is eligible to be used 100% federal um, at the state's discretion. The state the state actually is given the ability to to make that determination. So we'd have to request that they allow us to do that. Um, this the the other framing of that is um, one we have a tip policy that for the projects awarded through the sub-regional processes uh, that there be at least a 20% local match and that for the regional share projects, it's 50-50, correct, Todd? 50%? Correct. Yeah. And so we've got a bunch of projects that, um, you know, project sponsors that put together applications, they put together projects uh, based on based on those minimum non-federal uh, uh, match com components. So we've got one chunk of funds then that comes in that's now able to be used 100% federal. Um, what about those projects that are have already moved forward or are already moving forward and they've met their their kind of tip policy uh, minimum non-federal match requirement? Um, how do we how do we do this equitably? How do we decide which projects get to use uh, funds at 100%? Um, how much does that reduce? Uh, the ability to leverage these funds to get more economic benefit, because obviously then, uh, you know, there's there's less money to go around to to more projects. So we're I, I will admit that we're struggling a little bit to figure out a fair process for determining that. Um, I appreciate your suggestion, Eileen, about sort of projects that could go to add uh, more quickly. I might suggest that if a project is ready to go to add that quickly, maybe it's already programmed and ready to go to add and it doesn't necessarily need 100 uh, percent federal funding to move forward so I'm, I'm just i'm trying to figure out how to work through that process yeah and if i could just add it from a little bit of a local perspective or flavor on that is you know one of the things is that all of um and i'll speak on on behalf of denver our budgets are slashed um you know, our staff is furloughed i know our tv is laying off numerous, numerous staff at multiple levels. Um, again, I, I was furloughed in 2020, furloughed in 2021, and that's just our operation side, our capital side, severely slashed. So yeah. when I think, when I when I am suggesting to use 100% of the funding, it's also to consider is, sure, if projects are ready to go to add, then they may not need that local funding share. But on that, we can use every single penny that we can get back into our coffers. So if there's a way again to supplement and to use that 100% maximum funding, then we can take that and shore up our other projects that again, our budgets have been severely slashed. So that's just yeah. more commentary from the local side of the house yeah. um, on that issue. Totally, totally appreciate that and understand that Aline. And I, I know 
Denver's not alone in that. Um, the I I was which is why I was surprised last year when CDOT made made the opportunity available to can to utilize um, available um, toll credits to relieve local project sponsors of local match requirements on projects that we didn't get any takers. Thank you. Um, is there any other hands raised, Cam? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next hand I see raised now is from Elizabeth uh, Relford. Elizabeth, when you're ready, please go ahead and please state your um, the organization you're a part of. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. I'm with Weld County, and my question is related to our uh, Southwest Weld County Forum. Uh, I, I see that the State Highway 52 PEL is listed as having uh, funding for this um, additional money. We had originally fully funded that project through our sub-regional funds. I know Dr. Cog chooses the type of funding that gets associated with those projects. I guess I was just curious if this is um, a, a difference to that, like you're changing the funding source um for for that project or if it helps supplement our sub-regional forum um because my understanding is that we had fully funded it at 1.25 million so is the 750 that's remaining the difference of that 1.25 million and you're choosing instead of using our sub-regional forum funds to use covid funds I think the answer is unknown yet. So we will certainly stick with the process that we always have, where uh, we will work with the forums and the pro and the project sponsors to select the best projects going forward, and then assign a funding type sort of after the fact that best fits the situation. Um, so I think it's too early to tell. But if uh, certainly in this case with the State Highway 52 PEL, and it already does contain a certain funding type, um, I would have a hard time we would actually change out that funding type. Um, I think in any project sponsors, if we do happen to change the funding type, uh, we will certainly work with you, alert your local agency engineers, and try to make it as smooth of a process as possible. Okay. Well, I, I guess I maybe it's more confusing to me to just see that it says it's on the waiting list when I thought we had it as fully funded. I, I thought maybe other projects similar to how you have identified the pedestrian underpass as um, on the list on our was on our waiting list. I guess yeah. that maybe that was just the clarification, Todd. I was just confused by that. Gotcha. Yeah, if I if I remember, um, Region 4 did agree to cutting their original funding request down to be able to meet that original funding target for the forum um, and that remaining amount just happened to be um, then placed on the waiting list itself. Okay. But, uh, certainly you they, and I can have a little addi additional conversations and follow up. Okay. That would be fine. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Cam, do we have additional uh, hands raised. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, we have an additional hand raised from Alex Hyde Wright. Uh, Alex, I'm going to unmute you. Please state the organization you belong to, and when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. This is Alex Hyde Wright with Fulbright County. Um, I I want to circle back to Eileen's question um, about the increased federal share, and I certainly appreciate Dr. Cogstaff bringing up the fairness issue with that with that increased federal share, um, because I think it is an extremely valid concern. Um, unfortunately, without any easy answers in terms of how to award the increased federal share in an equitable and fair manner, um, I do want to advocate that we consider using the up to 100% federal share as part of this next round of stimulus funding. I think we'd be remiss if that wasn't on the table. Um, and I, I did want to voice some support for Eileen's idea to reward shovel-ready projects, so perhaps projects that are ready um, earlier could be eligible for that increased federal share. Um, I also wanted to bring up 
that the increased federal share might help um, our higher scoring projects on the wait list um, actually move forward because um, it's it's quite possible that projects that are quite high on the wait list now um, might have to turn back funding due to their lack of local match um, for reasons that Eileen mentioned. Um, so awarding that up to 100% federal share could ensure that our, our higher scoring projects on the wait list do move forward, um, which I think would be a good thing. Um, so I just want to recognize that there are fairness issues um, with projects that have already been awarded funding in the original TIP that um, don't have that 100% federal share now, and now we're talking about that for waitlist projects. But I think I think that should be under consideration um, given all of the budget constraints that uh, local agencies are having right now in order to move projects forward. Thank you, Alex. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. This is on. Can, yes. Sorry, may I ask a question? Sure. Could I suggest that maybe we do a quick informal poll Let's, can we pose that question to the group and by a show of virtual hands, um, who thinks we ought to develop a method for utilizing these funds at 100% federal share as allowed? I think that would be a great idea. So all of those that um, would like to see a proposal on the 100% shares, uh, would you please raise your hand? Uh, and it would be TAC members only. And Cam, I think we'll have to have you tally those for us. Okay. I'll give it one more second. And Rod, did I pose that question correctly for you? That was That was perfect, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chair, uh, the hands that I do see raised at this time, uh, they include Deborah Basquet. I don't think Don. you need to read all the names, Cam. Let's just, uh, I, okay. just I can total. visually see the list. We've got. Like there's 13, 12? Yeah. They have pretty good, fairly good majority of those present of the TAP okay. members. That was my next question. <laughs> so, so with that, what would be your um, process, Ron and Todd, to uh, develop that? And maybe we bring it back at the January TAC meeting for consideration. Yeah, for sure, Mr. Chair. I think that's exactly the right, that's the right approach. We'll we'll get our heads together. We'll we'll consult with some smart people and um, see if we can come up with a with a with a concept for how to do that. And okay. I think Eileen and, and Alex's feedback was helpful. Okay. And um, would you be looking at this for existing tip projects or just waiting list projects, or or would you consider both as you look at this? I think, Mr. Chair, um, my sense is based on the verbal feedback from Alex and Eileen, we'd be we'd be looking at that for all projects that might be able to take advantage of the COVID relief, the coronavirus relief funding portion. Okay. All right. So um, with that, if um, You'll un if you'll lower your hands and then anyone that would like to speak yet, um, uh, Cam, please indicate who those might be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like Eileen Yazi has a question that she posted. Um, Eileen, would you like to? Uh, speak on that question yeah sure I, I just wanted to note that um when this policy discussion comes back or as we work through it i think one thing to note is attachment two related to the wait list um projects whether it's regional sub-regional i believe that they are just the um the the 80 percent cost share request and not the 100 percent project cost so there may need to be a little uh additional 
and we I kindly requested work on behalf of Dr. Cobb to um, flesh out that analysis of what the impact to fund the projects at 100%. That's correct. Right, Eileen, this is Todd. So the amounts that are listed in the waiting lists themselves are the request made to Dr. Cog. It does not contain what percentage um, that the sponsor requested at and what the total cost is. So we certainly can add to that. Thank you, Todd. And then uh, one other question I have is, will you also bring an option where, say, the regional share was 100% and the sub-regional was 80-20 and vice versa? Would you take a look at that also? Mm -hmm. Okay, as an option as we go into these discussions. Thank you. Cam, are additional hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair, I see a hand raised from Art Griffith. Art, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, um, just to clarify, um, the if, if you're going to go without a match and allow 100% of the funds uh, to be used, would that only apply to um, the projects on the waiting list and like in Jefferson County's case the call for projects or would that trickle down to uh the current projects that um were already allocated by the sub regions that could get more complicated <laughs> so um i just throw that out as um can you clarify yeah our this is this is ron i think um my 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 inclination is that um, that would be available for um, any project in the tip using using those funds. So not just the projects on the current wait list that are currently um, unfunded or un, you know it would be unprogrammed tip projects as well. They're technically funded but unprogrammed. So it does make it a little more complicated. Um, but Todd and I'll do our best to come back to the PAC with an option. Um, I will take the opportunity. Mike Mike Whitaker from um, Lakewood did pose a question that saying that you know, stating that knowing a project was possibly eligible for 100% funding, they might have submitted many more projects. I think that's that's true of everyone, Mike. Um, but that's not our tip policy. We have a one-time opportunity for a for you know a discrete source of funds and an amount of funds that can be 100% federal. Um, and what what we've heard today is a uh, majority of TAC members wanting us to put together an option for further conversation that but uh, as best as possible could fairly and equitably um, extend that extend that opportunity to local project sponsors. Okay, thank you. Cam, is there additional hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any new hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, what, uh, uh, Ron and Todd, what are you considering shovel ready? Something that's getting close to 30% plans and can be under construction in 18 to 24 months or something that's going out to bid, ready to go to bid? Um, I don't know if we have a a firm definition, but I think anything that could go to add still in FY21 or even FY22 would certainly meet that criteria. Um, we'd have to talk about and have further discussions whether or not that could creep into 23. But I think as of right now, we certainly could call shovel ready uh, anything that would be able to go to add within the next year and a half or so. Thank you. Cam, are there any additional hands raised? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I see uh, a question from Elizabeth uh, Relford. So, Elizabeth, I will unmute you, and when you're ready, please go ahead. 
Thank you. I, I just had one more clarifying uh, question. Uh, obviously, our sub-regional form, forums have IGAs with Dr. Cog through the fiscal year 23 step, uh, or TIP. Um, and if projects go into 2024, I, I don't know if it hurts to have some kind of language or something clear that we don't have to have another IGA in place to have them use the funding within 2024, even if our IGAs with our forums only go through 23? So not every forum, so let, let me back up a second. I, I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but really it's an IGA that's created between the individual forums and Dr. Cog. It's it's really more of a forum agreement that this is how we're going to operate, um, and I think that's a that's really a fluid discussion that needs to happen at the forum level um, in terms of that that is something that you would like to adjust um, that way. Yeah, Elizabeth, this is Ron. There's nothing in nothing in your forum operating IGA among the members of the forum that would impact the abil the ability to utilize the federal funds. We can we can deal with if if your if your IGA has an expiration date on it and it needs to be renewed or extended, you can kind of do that on your own on your own time frame. It really doesn't impact the utilization of the federal funds. Well, I, I think we originally with our forums and Dr. Cog only did one tip cycle because you wanted to see if this was going to be a a process you guys wanted to pursue in the future. So I guess what I'm saying is if I hear that you guys are still good with wanting to pursue the, the forums in the future, you know, I just didn't want to preclude anybody from being able to use funding in 24 just because a Dr. Yeah. Cog forum IGA would have been, you know, expired. Yeah, we that won't. That won't be a problem, Elizabeth, but yeah, the dual model process is going to extend at least through the next um, four-year TIP process. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Cam, is there any additional interest? No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any new questions or hands raised at this time. Thank you. So Ron and Todd, um, would we expect something back at, at the January meeting then to further this discussion? Um, yes, I think that's the best um, time and location. I mean, that gives us, that's a couple of weeks away. Um, so that certainly puts things in perspective for us put to uh, put together some options um, that the TAC can really go through and discuss in detail and figure out what might be the best path forward. And at that, by that meeting also, will you have the list of, pro, is it your uh, plan to have the list of projects from the waiting list that, or, or not the waiting list, and I guess it would be the waiting list that would want to move forward, or would you wait till after that discussion? Um, the way I kind of look at this, if, if we're gonna have discussions on, how to integrate projects that may be funded at a 100% versus 80-20, I think it would be best to wait until we get sort of the full direction going forward. Um, and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it might be best to wait a couple weeks um, to really get the tax input, because um, that possibly could change people's thought process if they are aware that they can or cannot, you know, uh, request their project to be funded at a different percentage rate. I think that I think that's right, Todd. I, I, and and quite frankly, even without a complication of trying to come up with a way to uh, potentially utilize the 100% federal fair federal share component of these funds, it would have been challenging for us to to have all the conversations that we need to have with local project sponsors to bring bring a list to the January TAC meeting anyway. So I hadn't anticipated that we would we would be quite there yet in terms of a formal list. Um, but we'll see what kind of progress we can make in the next week or so. But I think it's mainly going to be focused on the remaining policy questions. In the meantime, we'll, we will continue to have our conversations with the local project sponsors um, and probably think about it in a couple of different ways. Okay. 
that may help some of those that are now be setting up sub-regional forums as to they may want to wait till after that TAC meeting then to, to have their conversation if they need to. Cam, are there any additional hands raised? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like Eileen Yazi has a question. Uh, Eileen, if you're ready, please go ahead. Sure. Um, thanks again for um, allowing me to ask a few more questions. I think one area that would be really helpful from the TAC perspective, I think one, not only looking internally at ourselves or individually about where, you know, if we have, if we're the project sponsor and what the status is, but I think all, I think actually really understanding the status, the readiness and the um, kind of support for projects that are on the regional uh, regional wait list will be really helpful for this, this collective body to understand, to then kind of again say, yep, we can begin the wait list project or you know what, we need to go to number four about, about you know, grabbing projects, for new call for projects. I think that that's one of the things that would be really helpful that maybe we could, again, collectively and individually focus on for the next TAC meeting so that we understand where we are at, you know, at as a whole and then kind of individually on those different lists. I think that could be really helpful about kind of that, one, are you still interested? Um, are you, and then obviously there's a whole different set of questions of, yes, you're underway and where are you at with the status and things like that. So I, I think that there's a variety of questions that could be answered for us to for us to have kind of a more uh, more fruitful conversation about moving forward. Thank you, Eileen. Any other questions or, or hands raised, Cam? I do see a hand raised, Mr. Chair, from Chris Hudson. Uh, Chris, please state the organization you belong with. And when you're ready, take it away. Hi, this is Chris Hudson with the Town of Parker. Just one question. Uh, there's 36.2 million for the COVID number. How confident are you guys with that number? I know that things have been very fluid with this current act that they just got approved, but just curious if you think it's going to change at all or substantially change? Um, Ron, I actually might have you weigh in. You've had more discussions <laughs> with CDOT than I've had on this. Yeah, I mean, Chris, I, I, I would, I would be, I, I'll be fairly confident that it's probably not exactly $36,200,000. Um, beyond that, it's probably in the ballpark. I think I, you know, uh, until we see the actual apportionment tables from Federal Highway Administration sometime in the next probably probably week or so, pretty and could be pretty soon. FTA FTA issued their apportionment tables this morning uh, for the relief funding, so I, I think it'll be we'll we'll see it probably before the January TAC meeting. Um, uh, that said, it's probably going to be slightly different than thirty six million two hundred thousand dollars, but it's probably in the ballpark. I think I had run some preliminary numbers and it was right in that ballpark and you know CDOT's estimates are usually awful good. I mean we we kind of know how the formulas work. So I'd say we're we're pretty darn close. Well and Chris this is Todd. So there's part of this entire conversation there's another wrinkle obviously where some of the a portion of the funding um, that's available is not at 100%. And that is, of course, the $17 million that we already have unallocated. On top of that, we we believe that there may be additional FY21 money coming our way, but we are unsure on what that amount is. Um, it may be just a few million dollars, uh, but certainly that is possible to add to this total um, where we you know, beyond the original 17, we really don't have an exact number for either pot yet. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, are there additional questions or hands or questions? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do see another hand raised by Jeff Dakenbring. Uh, Jeff, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. This is Jeff Dakenbring with the City of Centennial. Uh, since we're talking about adding wrinkles to, to the situation and scenarios as well, my question, when you look at the Rappo County form and the waiting list, there's a project that already has a, a remaining amount on the waiting list. And so if you're going to consider 100%, how are you going to work with the project that's obviously fulfilling the rest of their, their funding obligation with this as well? And so that's one question. The other question is, if there's money to be carried over to like number two in this particular waiting list, whatever money that we can't cover with the, the five million dollars that we have for Centennial there, is the project sponsor going to be responsible for making up whatever difference there would be as well? Um, all good questions you ask. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I don't know if we're at that point yet. And I, I think that is part of the conversation that Ron and I need to have still um, in really developing, uh, you know, a number of scenarios for TAC to really walk through. And as you mentioned, it, I think it's going to be a lot of what ifs. And Jeff, this is Ron, just to highlight the second part of your question, which I think was, if I got your question right, was what if there's what if there's not enough federal funds available to um, award the federal funding request for the waitlist project? Was that your second question? Exactly. So our, our policy is quite clear. Um, in that case, the project sponsor has the option of accepting the available federal funds and um, and committing to delivering the entire project scope that that was requested, um, and and that that commitment is held to that the then the project sponsor figures out a way to fund the rest the rest of the project and deliver that that entire project scope. Um, so that okay. part that part of our policy is pretty clear. Exactly. I just wanted that confirmation as well. So I greatly appreciate that. Thank you for that question. Um, any additional hands or questions, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, I do not see any additional hands uh, at this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ron and Todd, do you have any closing remarks? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've sort of laid everything out. Um, at least from our perspective, and certainly have heard um, some great comments. Um, certainly within the next week or so, we'll take this back internally, work up some options that we can put into a memo for everyone and begin to have those discussions uh, at TAC here in a couple of weeks. All right. Okay, thank you. Ron, did you have any additional? Nothing further, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay. With that, then I believe we will stand adjourned here at 228, and I thank you for your participation and look forward to seeing you on at the uh, scheduled TAC meeting. I believe it's January 25th. Thank you. Bye.